Berlin. Uh, thank you so much for coming, everyone. Uh, my name is Akar Blake, obviously from N26. Uh, thank you, Lou and the family people, for inviting me again. I was here back in the summer, as Lou said, uh, to give a talk about designing for emotional experiences. I think the talk is already online. If you're interested, you can uh, watch that. Uh, so what are we talking about today? Growth at N26. Uh, just a brief intro. So I'm Akarsh. I'm the product owner for the growth team at N26. Uh, Blake is our experience designer and we work together on everything related to growth uh, at our company. Uh, just a quick question. How many of you are using N26 or have heard about it? Oh, that's a lot of you actually. Anyone who's not heard about it and not used it? Okay, that's okay. <laughs> Maybe still for 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 two lovely people who have not heard about N26, I would still uh, give uh, a quick introduction uh, about where N26 we are today, uh, as of now. So we're the first mobile bank in Europe. Uh, this is actually very surprising to hear that it's 2017. We're almost going into 2018 now. That uh, there is no bank account in Europe which actually works pan-European. I mean, I myself, I'm from India. I've lived in three different European countries, and everywhere I've had to open a different bank account. And there is no no single uh, bank which works seamlessly across borders. And it's weird to think about this idea that N26 is actually the first bank which works across uh, different countries and uh, the, the MasterCard just works. The, the experience is pretty seamless. Uh, we have more than half a million users across uh, 17 different countries. So every country in the European Union, uh, except for Cyprus and Malta, is where we are active in with the euro currency, so the SEPA region. Uh, and uh, we have absolutely no paperless, uh, like uh, you can open an account without any paperwork or any kind of German bureaucracy, I'm sure some of you at least are familiar with, that happens here. Uh, I know I am. I opened a Deutsche Bank account when I moved to Germany, and I pulled my hair apart in the first three weeks. Uh, and this is something which is very interesting that N26 is also one of the first banks around uh, Europe which actually has real-time banking. It's a very, very simple thing, but extremely hard to do that you have full control and control over what is happening in your bank account. And I was very surprised when I first moved here and started using Deutsche Bank that I get a notification of an email or an SMS two weeks later or two days later once I make authorize a transaction. Like, why isn't it instant and real time? So this was actually very surprising that we have uh, these instant notifications and they just work uh, and users just feel complete control of their, of their account in general. Uh, and uh, this is something interesting that uh, N26 has done over the past couple of years is have one-click access to different financial products and services. Uh, it's been done in two different ways. One is we've created our own products. So if you see, some of you must have used overdraft. So if uh, you're going below, if your account goes negative, you can actually request an overdraft uh, up to 2,000 euros. So this is our own product, so given out from the N26 bank itself. Uh, something else that we've done is we've integrated third-party other financial services and other fintech Companies. So, for example, we have transfer-wise integration to be able to send money across different currencies and different uh, countries as well. I think we support 19 different currencies right now. And that's integrated seamlessly into our uh, transfer functionality. So the front end is always controlled by us. It is our experience. People don't feel that they are leaving the N26 ecosystem, and it's just integrated inside of it. Similar thing with, uh, we've done this with uh, a fixed term savings account that people can put away some money and get an interest rate over a period of time. Uh, and th that is also done with a partner called Raisin. I think they also were here to talk uh, at the family a couple of days ago, I think. A uh, similar thing with uh, credit, actually, we launched our uh, loan, the credit feature in France yesterday with the release that went out. Uh, so now we uh, give out loans to people in France if they, if they want some. Uh, so this is the status of the product uh, that we have right now. Uh, N26 has been live since 2015 January as a, as a public uh, product. So it's been a little almost around three years and this is the, the status of the product today. Uh, we have certain competitive advantages of why we have managed to scale uh, our customer base to more than half a million users in just less uh, than three years, uh, considering the nature of the product is uh, it, 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 it's, it's a high barrier to entry of a product, right? It's not like Facebook that you can just sign up, see something. It's a bank. People, we, people have to trust their money with us. Uh, we have certain competitive advantages in terms of growth. That is, we don't have any IT legacy. Everything is built on a single layer of a technology stack that we can control uh, and uh, change very, very easily. 
we can scale very fast because what we are scaling is people and software engineers mostly, uh, and we don't have any physical infrastructure, so our costs are very, very low. So uh, the customer acquisition cost is extremely low because we don't have to spend money on you know physical bank branches. And plus, yes, we uh, can scale. The direct impact of scaling is that we can go live. Like we can just turn on a switch and say, hey, we are now live in uh, uh, France or any other different country that we are live in. Uh, growth team. So giving a little bit more introduction as the growth team, what we do uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, we have two different tasks. We have to make it easier for people to get the best N26 experience. So usually a lot of you, when a lot of people, when they come across N26 is through different channels, uh, either their friends and family tell them about it, uh, they hear about it in, in the news, they read an article about it somewhere, uh, or they come across an advertisement on Facebook or something, uh, their first touch point with N26 is usually the products that are owned by our team. So the sign-up form, uh, the website, uh, the verification funnel. Uh, so it's our job to make that experience as smooth and as efficient as possible so that they can go into the bank account and actually start using the bank. So our team and the products that we create is the first touch point that users have with N26. And eventually it's our job to drive conversion. So we are always working towards making the funnel as optimized and smooth as possible. So we drive conversion from when people uh, come to our uh, advertisement or website or anything, and by the time they actually get inside to start using the bank account. Uh, talking about how the user journey looks like in rough ways, uh, we have different acquisition channels. So. Uh, a lot of people come across N26 in the App Store, so they download the app directly. Uh, we have some paid marketing efforts, but the biggest source of our traffic is still organic. So people are talking about N26, they're uh, recommended by their friends and family, they move to a different country and they hear uh, which bank account should they open. And so it's still a lot of organic traffic, that's how we uh, are growing so fast. Uh, referral is also very healthy and a very good source. Uh, some of you must have used the in-app friend referral feature. Uh, and then we have other sources like uh, affiliate and all whatnot. Uh, they go through the sign-up form, which is rather long because we have an involved process eventually signing up for a bank so there are certain things that we ask uh, from the user certain things we have to ask because of regulation uh, because we hold our own banking license so we have to be compliant uh, based on the German uh, regulatory authorities so we have to ask certain information uh, then people have to confirm their email they select which type of MasterCard do they want we offer uh, currently three different types of MasterCards uh, the regular MasterCard the premium product that we have uh, with travel insurance which is the N26 black card and uh, then we offer a business card with cash back and then people go through the verification process uh, which is actually the the video call that people have to do uh, and then they actually can get inside the bank account and start using uh, it for uh, with, with, like the complete bank account so th everything that is happening in this funnel is owned by the growth team in some ways. We have, uh, I mean, obviously certain here things are uh, part of the marketing department as well, but we work very closely with everyone and uh, this is mostly our responsibility. And then once people are inside the app, other product teams take over and then craft those experiences. So we have different teams like the savings team and the credit team and different products, uh, the account and the payments team who are uh, working on building whatever is happening inside the bank. So this is why it's important for us to be able to drive conversion across this journey and also uh, make the experience as smooth as possible. Uh, talking a little bit about how we work as a team, uh, we usually have, uh, we work in different uh, sprint cycles, so we follow the agile methodology and we work in, spr uh, in, in sprints, so we follow the scrum process and we work in uh, two week sprint cycles. How we try to structure the sprint cycles is usually these four different methods that we try to follow, is we have to identify opportunities or different problems that we see in the funnel that I just mentioned, that is there a problem in any different point in the funnel that people are having. How do we do that? We talk to people, we ask customers, we get them in-house, we talk to them, we do some research, we just call 10 customers in uh, somewhere in Austria saying what problem are they having and I do understand that. We do qualitative research, we send out surveys uh, to identify what opportunity or what problem are cu customers having that we can fix, uh, which usually leads to creating a hypothesis of how we can 
solve that problem. Uh, we build lightweight experiments, like extremely low effort but high impact projects we pick up uh, because as the growth team, we have to work in extremely fast cycles. We cannot spend three months building a product because what we work on impacts people on a day-to-day -day basis. If the sign-up form is down for a couple of hours, that means we might lose up a couple of hundred people who are signing up at the moment. So we have to work in extremely, fr uh, extremely fast cycles. Uh, we set clear goals to measure success and how do we actually say that an experiment or a project that we've run is successful. So we need to have very, very clear goals up front. Uh, and then in the end, we repeat the cycle. Some experiments are successful, some are not. So we need to be able to understand that what is working or not. So this is roughly kind of the cycle that we follow. Uh, I would give you one example of uh, how this cycle usually looks like. Uh, so I'm sure a lot of you must have done that. Uh, so we identified a problem that a lot of the users were not receiving their MasterCard. People sign up, they complete the entire process, uh, but they did not receive the MasterCard. That means they cannot use the, uh, the, the card and the bank account the way it is supposed to. We try to understand that what, what, what is going wrong. Uh, in terms of the banking protocol, uh, it's, uh, what happens is if a user does not receive the card, it comes back to our office. And there is one designated person who is supposed to be taking care of the cards, like who can open the cards, uh, who has the authority to open the cards, call the customer, uh, get the correct address, repackage it, and then send it off again. That is like a, f a process that we have to follow incredibly manual, so that means a person is sitting somewhere in our office fixing this problem. Uh, this is how we were asking the address from the users in the sign-up form. Very, very standard address field. You see, we asked for the street name, uh, the house number, postal code, city, country, uh, other information like CO, apartment number, and whatnot. In every market all across the European Union, this is how the address field looked like. Uh, so we created a hypothesis that there is something wrong happening here, which is causing the cards to coming back uh, to our offices. Uh, so we created a simple hypothesis that our shipping provider is not able to find the correct address uh, that is entered by the people. Our shipping provider is Deutsche Post and uh, UPS, uh, and they, they, they just cannot, when the postman goes out to, give, to deliver the card, they are not able to find the correct address. So we uh, had this hypothesis and we ran a small experiment on the sign-up form. Uh, in Germany, we kept the address field the same way it is. So we, we asked for the street number, street name and the house number. But if a person entered their country as France, we started swapping the house number with the street name. It's a very small change. It, 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 it could, we could deploy this in a couple of hours because this is all in web, so it doesn't actually have to go through an app release cycle. And uh, the result of this was our card return rate reduced by 30% by making this small change. And the reason is, in France, that's how addresses are entered. It's a very, very small detail, very easy to miss. I mean, all of us are using Amazon and Zalando and I don't know what not. Uh, I even, like for 10 years, I never bothered about an address field every time I bought something. And now when I was actually working as the product owner of this team, I realized how important and how difficult it is to crack because this is such an important part of the experience. If people don't get the cards, they can't do anything with the account. Uh, and this small thing reduced that a lot. Uh, and it's very easy to miss as well. Uh, so our card uh, return rates reduced by 30%. Also, we this is the lady who is actually responsible for fixing the card. So she's actually sitting like this uh, in one of our phone booths twice a week. Uh, she gets all these cards which are uh, returned to our office. She has to open them. She has to log them in her computer. She, you see the phone. She's actually calling the customers, asking for the right address. She's manually writing them down and then shipping them off again. So one of our other goals was to make this person happy and reduce her workload because she sits right next to where our team sits. So we really feel the pain that this is an extremely manual process. It takes 12 hours just to fix this. Uh, and re-ship the cards to the user. Once this first change was done, we started iterating a little bit more on the address field of what else could we do to fix this problem to reduce our cards because we still had uh, quite a few of cards coming back from different countries. Uh, so we did another iteration that uh, we realized that people were having typos while entering the address manually. So in Germany, the postal code is always five digits, but uh, sometimes people have errors. They, 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 they mistype it like four or six or something, which also causes the cards to come back because 
they they're just printed on the label they are delivered but then the postman they cannot actually find uh, where the address is because it's it's an incorrect address so what we implemented was a google maps geolocation api where people can just tap that button and it prefills certain information based on the location uh, this was we had to be very careful in implementing this because because this is on web, right? People could be, you could be signing up for N26 sitting here right now, but you don't want the family's address to be your uh, shipping address. Uh, but what it can do is fill out these certain fields, which probably would not change that much. I mean, you can manually change it, but still people have an idea that, okay, it's, uh, it's pre-filled the country, it's pre-filled the city, it's pre-filled the postal code, and they don't have to manually change it, so we reduce the error rate. A lot, and this is also what helped our uh, the the number of cars that came back to the office. Uh, it reduced the number a lot. Then we had another iteration that we did on the address field. Is a lot of the N26 customers are actually expats, so people who move from different parts of the world. They move to Germany. They move to different European countries but they have different ways of entering the address. They have different knowledge of how address formats are in their countries. So I'm, I'm from India, like there's a completely different way of how you write addresses compared to European countries. Uh, one thing that uh, actually works in Germany and France is that you need to have your last name on the mailbox. Otherwise, if you live in a shared flat and you've ordered a card in your name, the postman has no way to find out where the person lives in the building. So the card will get returned to us again. And this kept on happening again and again in France and Germany, and then people call our customer support saying, hey, we did not get our MasterCard. And uh, when the card comes back, we see this person has uh, entered uh, their address, but they haven't written whose name is on the mailbox. So we had to do another experiment, and then we just added a small little note field saying that please make sure the name is on the mailbox or, or your name is on the mailbox or whoever's name is on the mailbox to actually receive the card. One address field, three different types of experiments to actually reduce the return rate of uh, the MasterCards. Uh, extremely small, very easy to miss, but high impact project. This is what, at a high level, what the growth team is doing. Uh, I would hand over to Blake now to talk a little bit more in detail of how we actually do even more projects and experiments. Go for it. Um, yeah, hey everyone. Um, one second. Yeah, so my name is Blake. Um, I'm a product designer inside the growth team. Um, I'm sorry to be sort of in front of you today because I'm sort of going to run you through at least like how we use this process and how we can sort of, uh, yeah, ultimately reach this insane user acquisition growth chart. Uh, that's actually not us, by the way. That's not what us what our sort of acquisition looks like. It looks a bit more like Bitcoin, but. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, it, this is very, like, when we look at these graphs, you think this is insane. Like, what was the point that this started to happen? And it's really interesting to say, was it like a bold product strategy? Was it a insane PR? Or was it, um, I mean, dare I say it, like a viral campaign? And it's very, very easy to focus on these points. Um, so not to say that I don't believe that these sort of silver bullets exist. Um, but I think that what's, for me, and also in the, in the growth team, we like to focus on what were the sort of smaller incremental changes that really moved the needle over time, um, which ultimately led for this moment to truly flourish. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, this is what we sort of focus on in the growth team with these small experiments, and how can we sort of build these over time to really like ideally make this happen. Um, I think with our user, uh, like general sign up flows, uh, they, they can be quite, quite simple, like uh, first name, last name, email, birth date, and that's sort of about it, confirm your email, then we're done. Uh, understandably though, when signing up to a bank account, it's quite, quite more involved. So we've got to, got to make sure we, we know our customer, we've got to verify a lot of things. Um, but yeah, I mean, in the ideal case, we see 100 users that say, I want to start registration. Um, and it's very idealistic to think that 100 not only start, but complete the verification, then they order their MasterCard, they complete the verification, they receive their MasterCard and activate it, then they top up their account, and then they use their account. And if we've done a great job in the meantime, they refer their friends. The reality is that doesn't happen. Um, and you, and it's, it's fair enough because in this sort of information age, we are constantly begged for our attention. And like these sort of things pop up all the time. Like, I mean, of course I'm gonna tap on this. Um, so we've got to think of like, at what point during this flow can we sort of like pique their interest or at least keep them engaged during this whole thing? Uh, because it's super easy to, to be lost inside this process. Um, 
So yeah, I guess it's it's sort of like ties back into what Akash was saying in like identifying the opportunities, um, and we sort of look at all these things in our in our in our dashboards, and we can if we scale them up, we can see that the larger opportunity points, the huge drop-offs that we can sort of really tackle. Um, and I think, to be honest, some of these are quite obvious and sort of, as Arkash sort of mentioned, although the thing is with Arkash's example, we didn't exactly know there was an issue on the address field at that point in time. So people could have said 123 Fake Street, gone through the process, and we didn't realise, like, why are people lagging to activate their MasterCard? So maybe it's not always, like, um, relevant to that exact step, but over time we sort of could figure these out and sort of weed out the options. But at least for these ones here, sometimes they are very obvious. Um, users were finding it difficult to enter their phone number bit of a problem. Um, so much of a problem that it actually was 40% error rate on first shot, which is pretty crazy. Um, and to think that like it was it was a free for all field, like you just you had to put in plus four nine one five one and the eight digits after. It was very strict I feel, but um, this is the sort of thing that it, it mean it, of course that we're gonna have error rates of up to forty percent on this sort of field. Um, I think that what comes to mind with this is sort of Steve Krug's book, Don't Make Me Think. Um, if you haven't read this, definitely worth grabbing it. Um, but yeah, it's sort of things like if he, he draws the notion that if a w when a website makes you stop and think about what you're doing and you're making life harder, it's probably not as designed as well as it should be. So, um, so we sort of drew on this and drew some hypotheses that users from different regions have different ways of entering their phone numbers which we are not accepting. It's not a matter of it's their error, but it's more that we weren't accepting these, uh, these, these sort of way they enter it. And again, very simple, but what we saw is that we added, we separated sort of the, the area code from the actual rest of the number. Um, we added some pretty lax validation on this sort of step as well. Um, we're very lenient, so if you type in uh, 0049, uh, we strip the two zeros and we put plus four nine. If you just put four nine, we also just add a plus for you. So we're very lax on this as well. Um, the other thing is, if you say you're from Germany, we also use the information that we know you're from Germany. So we're going to put plus four, plus four nine. However, if you are from the UK and you have a UK number, you need plus four four. And if you start to type plus four four, if you even type in the UK, we also give you a little suggestion down the bottom as well. So at least helping the user feel like, oh, I'm not really making any mistakes here. I hope this isn't a guess. Um, because just the other day, my mate was buying flights to Amsterdam and he was like, wait, do I have to drop the zero? You had to multitask, get to the contact, see if it was his number. And he was like, I think that's right. And he put it back in. These are the things we don't want these drop offs happening or at least to create this error or like doubt of error. Um, the second part as well, like for inside different regions as well, sometimes they have brackets, they have spaces, they have dashes, all these things. So strip them out, you can't make a mistake, it's chill. Um, and we actually found that before we had error on first trait of 40%, it dropped to 8%, which is insane to see as well. Um, again, small little changes, and although it doesn't look like much of a difference, that's how much people were then not being stressed out, not creating this extra cognitive load inside their head to think like, am I making a mistake here? Which was a cool result to see. Um, I guess the takeaway from this is that internationalization for us doesn't only mean translations, because we thought that, yeah, we open up in France, so everything's going to be fine, we just get a translator and everything's great, but it really is, doesn't come down to this. We need to understand that users have different ways of doing things, and it's not that it's wrong, we need to understand how they do them. Uh, the second problem we sort of found, and it, like we go through lots of different iterations in these steps, so I'll just show you sort of like at what steps we sort of took these decisions. Um, but the first problem, the, the second problem we sort of found was users were starting but not completing the verification call and dropping out. Um, it's a bit of a problem. Um, verification is probably the longest process in the entire sort of sign up flow and onboarding. Uh, it's a five minute video chat. Maybe you guys are familiar with it. Um, but the five minute video chat. Uh, Although it is a bit of a pain, um, <coughs> it's probably a lot faster than going to see a bank teller and waiting in line. So we sort of, that's all right, we, we sort of take it like that. Um, but what was happening is once you do this, you sort of go through here, you hit this checkbox, you go through this checkbox, this one, and finally the terms and conditions, and then we start the video chat. Who can tell me what these like four steps were that we had to go through? Anyone? Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's two more. Well three more. Yep. Yeah, well, no, it's fair. I I'm guilty too. I completely did not read any of that. Um and I actually started my video call on the U barn. Terrible idea. Like we say I mean we say open up your account from anywhere, but don't do it in the U barn. Like it's a very bad idea. Um but what we actually looked at was it was actually these four steps. So you needed to get your passport ready and we need to make sure we can see and hear you properly. 
Um, we also needed good internet connections. So, I mean, it seems very obvious, but these things are being overlooked. And finally, the terms conditions. Um, and we sort of found that our hypothesis was that users weren't reading the content in the checkboxes because they were, and therefore weren't prepared for the video call. I mean, I don't think it's a, it's a bit of a no-brainer. People don't really read checkboxes, um, but in this case, we really needed them to do that. So I guess like a bit of a problem that was sort of like fast-tracking them through this. Um, so we re sort of like this was also over a couple of sprints, but we sort of looked at how can we make this experience make sure they actually understand at, at each step what they need to do. Um, this was sort of a, a bit of an experiment, as sort of Akash pointed out, to like throw these rapid experiments out to see if they even work. Um, we decided before the video call, we'll just add a little play now button. I don't know if we can play this here. Um, so a video producer put this one together. He had one day, and we thought, like, this is a bit of a hypothesis. Can we make this enjoyable and they can understand what's going on here? So we, yeah, put this one together. Um, but more, it was like for more of like a proof of concept, um, and we actually, well, we're not going to work here. Mm, hiccup. Um, but yeah, so this is more of like a proof of concept. Very quick, Tim had one day, and he rapidly pulled <coughs> this together, which was super cool to see. Um, that's also the next slide I need. Yeah, um, and we found that. We didn't want to push this onto users either. This was the thing that we thought, maybe we give them the option to watch a video to prepare for themselves. Um, but we actually had, of the 50 second video, an open rate of about 50%, which is insane to see. Um, this was voluntary. We didn't make them sit through this and say, you must watch this video before you prepare. But this was an immediate impact that we saw, which was um, obviously beneficial for us and people we had. A, obviously, the, the agents were more prepared, uh, the user was more prepared, and it was just sort of a great experience to see this. Um, there were a couple of problems with it, though. Um, we sort of overlooked this. We're fair enough. You can inside a day, um, but we, sh we shot the video <laughs> in in uh, landscape, and people are watching this on on mobile. So yeah, easy oversight. Uh, the next thing was this. Uh, this is actually uh, one of business development interns, and she, what was it? She w had a Swiss ID, so we had a lot of CS complaints saying like, "Oh, we see that there's a Swiss ID. Can we? Can my friend from back home open up in Switzerland?" Uh, which was pretty, like, so we didn't really account for as well. And it, I think just the overall tone was very, like, clinical as well. Um, we shot this in our office, so it was very, um, the, the lighting's a bit off. It just doesn't feel like you're at home. And it wasn't the environment that we expected our users to do their vi verification call. Oh, I have another one, sorry. <laughs> um, so we changed it to this, and Tim sort of put a lot of effort in this one. So like we're using the UI elements as well to sort of help users understand that this is how the interface will look. But yeah, so I mean this format was much more appreciated from um from our users as well. Uh, they weren't having to be forced to turn their, their phone sideways. I'll see. Are we going to work? Yeah, cool. Yeah, so that was sort of one thing that we sort of rapidly pulled together to see if this is going to help over in improve the overall experience. I mean, if a picture says a thousand words, oh, okay, a video, that's a bit too much. But um, the next sort of thing we worked on as well was um, 
by understanding the user and what documents they needed, we also wanted to place a lot of emphasis on continue with documents because we wanted to make sure that they actually knew that yes, I should have my passport or national ID ready. We also made this uh, localized for either France because they required the passport and national ID. For Germany, they required passport or ID. Um, and in Italy, they required the passport or plastic national ID. This was also a bit of a problem because the thing that we need is the hologram on the ID. So if we can't see that on a paper ID, then yeah, we can't really go forward with it. Um, but yeah, so these are the small little changes that we sort of made to help like get the, the user better prepared with their documents. Next thing, we added a, a speed test. So this was, um, this would have helped me, um, but this was sort of a quick speed test to understand, do you have a strong enough connection? If, if no, we're gonna have to go back and try again. If yes, we say, nice, keep this strong connection in a quiet space. Um, and the next thing, finally, although te uh, terms and conditions, yeah, everyone loves them, but I think it was very important to place this on its own page. Um, I think that by sort of desensitizing it and placing it amongst other checkboxes, it sort of devalues the importance of understanding the terms and conditions that you will be signing up with ID now to, to complete the verification call. Um, so it's a bit of a question, like, why would you have already long flow? Why would you go from two to four screens um, with all these small incremental changes? Um, because the call failure rate, um, actually dropped, which was amazing to see. And we saw that for the reason for the call failure rate for poor, for poor internet connection dropped by 44% and user cancellations during the video call dropped by 26%. And this meant that they either had a great sort of, uh, uh, yeah, like an internet connection and they didn't have this like, hello, yes, sorry, can you hear me? No. Uh, but also for the fact they had their documents ready and they didn't have to abort the call and, and come back at a later date. Um, so the takeaway from us was that don't focus on moving users from A to B in the fastest way possible if it ultimately hinders their experience. Um, I mean, it, it does make sense to try and get people through your flow as fast as possible, um, but maybe it's time to stop and smell the roses sometimes to really make sure they look at this information and sort of digest it because, yeah, it, it ultimately hinders everyone in this experience as well. Um, and third, uh, very quickly, like we saw a problem that there was significant delay for people starting the verification call after choosing their MasterCard. Um, and switching device is very hard. Um, we sort of give the freedom that you can register from your laptop, from your mobile, um, but due for the verification call, you need to do this on your phone. The camera quality is better, the lighting, we can actually signal the flash so you can check out the hologram, um, and it just doesn't cut it on the laptop. So we have to push users to the next platform. Um, and so we, the quick hypothesis of switching devices is hard, uh, especially without a seamless experience between them. So very simply, we threw a text me a link button. I see this a lot in the, in the beginning of, um, of sign up forms, but you have to enter a new number, probably with this validation it might be strict, I don't know, but um, the text me a link button um, immediately we saw in the last week 2,000 people had sent this, this message to themselves. So again, removing this friction. Um, because switching platforms is hard, so embrace a seamless handoff experience, um, which was a big sort of takeaway for us. And especially while we're trying to create this multi-platform experience, we should have this sort of handoff, and we should know that the next, like, anticipate the next move for the user. Um, at this point, I sort of want to like change gear and talk about Juice for a moment. Um, it's not because I love Juice. Um, for me, it's actually quite overwhelming. I mean, it's it's completely saturated. I mean, what do you choose? You've got like like artificial sweeteners, pulp, no pulp, um, it's, it's super overwhelming and understandably so. I mean, the thing is though, we, there's, there's one juice of, of Spring Valley and they have little facts on the inside of their lid. Um, it doesn't cost them anything to do this. Um, and what I love about this is that this is a post-purchase sort of enjoyment. So this is never the reason why I picked up Spring Valley in the first place. But this is something that I sort of enjoy after I crack open the bottle of orange juice and I can now get this fact. Not only have I got my drink, but I've also got a fact I can tell around my mates and now I look really smart. So um, I actually looked, there's 270 facts. Um, you can see them online. But um, this is something that at least I have no, I've now got a bit more of a connection with this brand. Um, and as I said, it doesn't cost anything to use, but it's a sort of, it leaves the user with something that sort of relates to their brand or it gives them something else than, other than just the product that they've just been sold. Um, so I guess the takeaway for this was focus on building an enjoyable experience as in a way like you could just throw away all the advice I've just sort of given but uh, focus on building an enjoyable experience first because at the end of the day users will be using this as well or people sorry um, and I guess this is where we start with the login screen um, being a financial institution we do have to log you out like Airbnb, Spotify they keep you logged in for convenience but we have to auto log out 
Um, when you're logging in, there's a lot of anticipation sometimes. Um, we don't know like what sort of the balance could be. We might have to send off uh, I don't know, money for our insurance or whatever it is. So why don't we make this as peaceful as possible? Um, again, this doesn't cost us anything, but we thought, how can we make this experience a bit more enjoyable and, and take the ease off what you're about to do? Um, and next thing is, like, hopefully you never see this screen, um, but this is if your verification has failed, so you just sort of have to chill out for a moment. Um, it's more about, like, um, how can we turn a negative experience into a positive one? Uh, and I think this is sort of central to, to N26 and how we build our products, um, because ultimately we want to leave a, a lasting impression on our users. Um, again, so when you're going through the flow, you've chosen which account you'd like, um, you enter your occupation, and now it's time to choose your card. And th these are really brilliant designed by, by Taryn, um, our designer at N26. And the thing is that this is one of the most exciting products. This is one of the only physical touch points we have with our user. So we want to show it off and we want to show this is the emotional connection you could have with this product. Um, we threw these here, but then also our developers, uh, Tom and Hugo, were like, why don't we chuck the names on there, because we can do that. Um, for a lot of users, they might overlook this. They might never see this as well. But for those that do notice, they say, well, this is a nice, lasting impression. This is the, the user, uh, N26 knows who I am, and they're sort of tailoring the experience for me. Um, again, like, all of these things are never with conversion in mind, like these smaller like, moments of delight, I guess. Um, but this is also a funny example. Like, but this was the before uh, express card delivery, and we felt it was very heavy-handed to say, do you want express card delivery, which... In the focus, I mean, understandably, it's very like information dense, and, but we decided like let's remove the bias, let's not heavy hand them and say, hey, let's like we can express ship your cards. So we removed the bias, and because we're at the end of the sprint, we thought why not animate the express card one? Because why not? It'd be fun. But this is the results we saw in um, in express card delivery. So we ran this as an A/B test, but we turned it off, like obviously because express started to skyrocket, and it was really crazy to think that we never anticipated this value in just creating a little animation, but. For some reason, it ultimately affected the bottom line of the business because now we've got express like skyrocketing, which is insane. Um, and sort of lastly, like we look at little things like create your password. Um, it's a it's a very dry field, and we sort of like how can we change this into something a little bit more memorable? Um, but mind you, the confetti actually doesn't exist. I put this there for the presentation. Um, <laughs> that would be a bit too intense. Um, but no, it, it's, a, it's a simple checklist. So we had to say it must be seven characters long, contain a number, lowercase letter, and uppercase. And as you sort of do the keystrokes, it sort of lights them up and you almost win a jackpot in a way. Um, and this was unexpected. Like Dominic tagged his mate saying, Samuel was saying, hey, you may need to open an account to check it, but the onboarding has some slick elements. This again is something that we never anticipated by just building an enjoyable experience. Um, and I guess what this also does is feed back into the top of the funnel again through referral to say, hey, you should hear about N26 because I use this. Um, next as well, like as the finance grade security needs to come in, um, we couldn't really sort of say you need seven characters, you need a number, a lowercase, because we wanted to make it sort of like you should create a, a secure password for yourself because otherwise we give the limitations up front. So we gave it a strength meter. Um, and down here, we sort of say, like, yeah, uh, please add some more special characters if you're not fulfilling the criteria. But at the last minute, we thought, well, what else can we write? So our copywriter was like, just say, yeah, this one's a keeper. And then, yeah, uh, oh, I can't say the name, Tananas, <laughs> um, tweeted this out saying, tiny words matter. And it was a really, like, sort of a sobering moment to say, well, yeah, it is true. Like, these things don't cost anything to do. But if it can ultimately feed back into the top of the funnel, then what we should really focus on, as for me, the most important one, also at N26, is to create an experience that people can't wait to tell their friends about. I'll hand you back over to Akash now. Yeah. I think a lot of things that uh, were mentioned in this last section, especially about uh, creating an experience that people actually share with their friends, these are things which you cannot measure. I mean, the express delivery is a very good example. This was a result of something that we did, uh, completely unexpected, but not everything can be done for conversion or business value or just growth numbers, because I think every growth team and every digital product company, they love dashboards, they love numbers. I have a ton of dashboards that I look at every single day, but results like these never come up, because we are not actively, consciously thinking about improving improving those experiences. Uh, this last takeaway that uh, we are talking about, creating an experience that people uh, can tell their friends about, I think this is a very important one and I would like to take a step back and 
show you this quote from the CEO of Airbnb. Uh, Airbnb as a company, they, their philosophy is always that let the users tell a better story about uh, them than they do, so let them do that. Uh, this is extremely important because if you can have like I'm sure a lot of you must be working in digital products and services in some way. If you can have your customers become brand ev evangelists and product evangelists of your product, you cannot have a b better growth driver than that. And this is very true. Like at 26 BC, the best kind of uh, people that we get are through people who come through referral, are people who are referred from their friends and family and colleagues, like all sorts of paid marketing efforts. Yes, they do work. They're very important. Everyone should do them, but nothing as compared to organic traffic that you get from uh, people who've recommended their friends, who've uh, used the referral feature inside the app. Uh, and this is why having this kind of a philosophy is becomes extremely important. And especially in our case that we are a bank, we are an extremely high barrier to entry of a product. It's not like to try it out. People have to put money in the account to try out a bank. Like you can't do anything with the bank without putting money in the bank. Uh, so it, it becomes extremely more important for us to be understanding that user value to actually grow and have these sort of crazy growth charts that everyone loves. Uh, keeping this in mind, uh, like as when N26 started two and a half years ago, uh, they started as an invite only uh, private beta. So that means if somebody had an invite, uh, if somebody could only get an invite if their friends or somebody they knew uh, would share it with them. And this was transitioned into a product as the referral product, which you see inside the app right now that you can share it with your friends. And if people sign up and you start using the account, uh, they get a small little bonus as an appreciation from our side uh, for inviting their friends to join, the, to, to join N26. A couple of months ago, we uh, like this is the friend referral program that we have uh, one of the best growth drivers that we have uh, for our product a couple of months ago we just gave it a design refresh this is how uh, the screen used to look like very low effort but had a lot of impact in terms of the conversions in terms of in terms of the number of uh, invites we were sending out per user it it, it, it really changed and uh, it, we also increased the reward from 10 to 15 euros as an appreciation to the people uh, for signing up for n26 uh, this is in fact my, my, my personal life I've been rewarded twice as well. Uh, but yeah, a lot of friends are still waiting to join N26. <laughs> but because I'm the product owner for this uh, product, I test out the feature a lot. So just constantly sending invites even to people who have them. Uh, yeah, so these are some of uh, the learnings as a, I would like to recap that internationalization does not only mean translations, we really have to understand uh, the users and the people in different markets in different regions, where they are coming from, what their need is, how they are used to doing things uh, to actually be an international uh, company and a product. Uh, we should not focus on moving users from A to B the fastest if it is actually hindering the experience. Sometimes slow is smooth, smooth is fast. Uh, and switching platform is hard. If you're working on products and services, which is across platform, web, iOS, Android, uh, embrace a seamless experience across platform. This is extremely important. Uh, uh, focus on building an enjoyable experience. It does matter, irrespective of conversion, irrespective of business value, irrespective of anything else. If it's something fun to use, people would like it. Uh, and creating an experience that people can't wait to tell their friends about. As I said earlier, that this, is, this could be the best growth strategy that your company can actually have. Uh, with this, we would uh, be happy to take any questions that you all might have. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the nice lecture. Uh, I have many questions, but let's limit that to two. Uh, the first question is, uh, uh, you said that you were surprised when you came to Europe uh, by the state of online banking. So how would you compare uh, European online banking to India and United States, and maybe if you have experience with Africa? And the second question is, like, if you have a scalable product where, which you can offer in many countries, why are you, you not present in more countries? Yes, uh, good question. So I can start from my experience. Uh, I'm from, from India. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I think it works. Uh, so the state of online banking in India, uh, I, I would talk in general from the Asian point of view because I also lived in Singapore and that's where I was living before I moved to Germany, that uh, countries like China, Singapore, uh, India, these countries do not have a technology legacy problem. 
these are some of these countries and markets are such where they never had the PC boom. They directly went from having no technology, no internet connection to directly having a cheap uh, on budget smartphone, Android phone with WhatsApp uh, internet connection and WhatsApp. So the usage behavior is very different. In Europe, you talk about mobile first. In Asia, in Asia, it's mobile only. Like you don't even consider having a multi-platform experience because people don't care about it. Uh, I lived in Singapore, like the the usage of smartphone penetration and apps is so deep it's like i'm sometimes surprised that we are kind of backward in europe because people still love their pc and you walk in shops around i don't know some uh, place here and you see windows 95 on a person who's sitting behind it and actually using it so that's one of the reasons it's it, it just a different point in time that why asia has taken this a little bit more uh, in terms of online banking especially uh, india for example there was one example I can share is this happened in November of last year that uh, in a move against corruption in the country, the prime minister and the Indian government, they basically devalued all the highest currency notes of the, of the country overnight. So what that happened is this digital wallet app in India called Paytm exploded. And now everyone in India uses that. So there is no comparison left anymore. Like it's either that or you can't pay money. Uh, this is one in a lifetime situation that any startup can come across and just become uh, so huge by external circumstances which nobody can control, but this is what it is right now. So when I, now when I go back to India, I actually have difficulties using cash because either people don't have it or I need to have money in my Paytm wallet to actually pay something. Uh, maybe you can talk about Australia if you have um, some yeah, insights. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's very also very competitive over there. Um, like we've got ComBank or NAB, or ANZ, um, but no, they all do a really great job. Um, they do a lot of like um, kind of like very similar experience to Venmo, like instant me uh, messaging. Um, but they've, they've also embraced these wireless chips. So when Apple Pay wasn't actually available yet, you could also just um, order a two euro card and stick it on the back of your of your phone. So it was sort of like a hacky way to use uh, Apple Pay. Um, but that was the sort of thing like we saw that it was, it was very sort of innovative and that's why when I came over here um, all these claims of like notifications and stuff like that was very surprising um, but then looking at the entire landscape of the banking industry it is, it is it's, it's coming to a crawl, uh, oh no sorry it's coming out of a crawl and it's starting to walk um, but I think it's exciting to see and, it, and that's why I think that we sort of had a bit of a leg up by not having as Arco said like a lot of legacy um, that we had to sort of like carry with us. Um, I think that also in terms of the question of like, did, did you ask about moving to Africa? Was it? No, no, no but compared to Africa. Oh, right, okay. doing uh, uh, internal banking on feature phones like a long time ago. Okay. So nobody, nobody has access to that. Yeah, okay. Just to so answer yeah. that. Uh, uh, when, when N26 started, actually, the core banking system that we are using, it's built on a platform called Mambu, which is an African company. So that's our African connection. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's, it's actually very, and to rightly to your point, like Africa was, uh, because they had no other option, they had to do it via f feature phones and smartphones. They build these kind of products now, which we are using in the in, in Germany to build N26, like the bank of the future, based on something which was used in Africa five years ago. And uh, to your question uh, of international markets, a couple of, I think last month in October, we announced our UK and uh, US launch plans in 2018. Second half of 2018, we will uh, launch in the UK and uh, investigate what are the launch plans for the United States. Uh, it's more about uh, right now doing a lot of the legwork in terms of as a German bank, because we hold a German banking license, what will it take for us to operate in the United States and the United Kingdom? Uh, so the team, our legal team is kind of trying to figure that out right now. But again, okay, also, as we mentioned that internationalization, we also have to think that everything over here what we offer is like a debit card but in the US you can't do anything till the time you have a credit history so what does that mean what does an N26 experience mean in a society where credit is such a huge part so then now the design teams will start working on that trying to understand it uh, we have a small uh, team based in New York right now trying to figure these things out um, so digital are you going to do anything on the digital um, platform or basis regarding um, digital, but also like um, maybe even into crypto? <laughs> Where, where's Hugo? Let's call Hugo here. <laughs> yes, you were waiting for the question the entire night. He asked me this before I started the talk. When is N26 doing crypto? Uh, <laughs> yes, this has been, so as a bank, as a financial services company, it's an ongoing topic. 
people talk about it. We have a lot of crypto enthusiasts in the company as well. I dabble in it a little bit myself. Uh, but I wouldn't say that it's immediately on the roadmap because we have a lot of things to figure out in the core banking segment itself first uh, before this sort of relatively niche topic, which is for hobbyists and enthusiasts right now. Uh, I mean, if you, I mean, that's what I said, right? Like, we're talking about real time notifications in banking. That's the most basic thing a smartphone feature launched 10 years ago. And this is now is becoming mainstream because N26 did it. So it's like, there's so much opportunity to fix and to improve things in just the banking experience that sort of these things take uh, not that much importance right now. But yeah, you never know, things change. Yeah, and also um, transferring like funds and paying people just like Venmo and that kind of thing, are you gonna introduce one of those a competing product that's gonna give people the ability to, through a messaging app or something, they can just swing funds from one to the other? Uh, you, you mean? Money beam. I mean, we have a peer-to-peer -peer money sending system. It's called Money Beam. So if like uh, both of us are N26 customers, I can just beam him, Money Beam him, uh, like lowest amount, like one cent to one thousand euros. But he has to be on N26. You could, if they have a different bank account or something, you can send him to the you phone number. You can send it to the. You can still do that. Like if you if they're not an N26 ecosystem, they can just put in the IBAN number and transfer it, and then they get an email and they get this like special link they can access and access the money through. So we already have that system in place. Mm -hmm. Have you encountered any kind of like uh, fraud related experiences? Because oh. that's probably <laughs> a big topic. Yeah. Where, where should we start? Uh, uh, yes, we do have a lot of uh, fraud uh, cases where people try to trick the system or uh, uh, they like try weird things in the verification call. Uh, we have certain protocols that are in place that are basically activated every time this situation comes up. Uh, one example is during the verification call, if because they're talking to an agent uh, who's verifying the identity and checking the ID card, uh, if they find that something is wrong with the document or something is not does not uh, like look correct, or if they have uh, what exactly happens in the call is the agent is verifying the information on the ID document live based on the information that they've already put in the sign up. So if there's a discrepancy in that information, if they cannot say the date of birth, uh, if they don't know their last name, if, they, if, they, if any of that information is made up, that person is immediately flagged uh, at that point in the verification call and they cannot move to the next step till the time somebody from our uh, legal and security team is verifying that information. That process is called uh, basically it's like AML, anti-money laundering, but it's like a broader term for everything fraud related. So we have uh, people who do that, and then they ha manually have to verify and check those people. Uh, and if something is wrong, we just we, they, they they cannot continue with us. As far as I know, like it's pretty difficult to open your account in uh, Deutsche Bank, for example. It's take your time, and it takes you know, like up to three three months for some of my friends. And you do it like like for everybody or almost. So what's secret? Why why is so open? No secret. <laughs> Technology. Uh, no. <laughs> uh, I think, that, as we mentioned earlier, that a lot of these processes, that why it takes time, uh, what is required, is a lot of the, that comes from legacy systems, which have been placed in 20 years, 30 years ago, which uh, it it takes too much time, effort, and money from those bigger banks to change it. Actually, I, if I, I read an article somewhere that uh, Deutsche Bank spent half a billion uh, euros in buying, in trying to upgrade their entire software architecture by buying a software from SAP, and that entire project failed. They burned half a billion euros trying to upgrade their technology, and nothing worked. Uh, because they're just so complex, and they have dependencies globally, Whereas we are a 300 person company based out of Berlin with half a million customers. So it's a different scale. So I wouldn't say there is any secret. It's just like we don't have any legacy problems. So everything that we do is now and we can do it very, very fast in small iteration cycles. Uh, like our banking and like our uh, payments and accounts team is a combined 20 software developers who've built the entire bank, basically. It's uh, yeah, it's just like a modern technology stack. So it sounds like they are really picky about uh, customers, and you are not picky. It's uh, just about this. I mean, they should not do fraud, but yeah. <laughs> okay. And second question, it's like more theoretical. You mentioned that it's import important to build uh, such experience that people would, would like to share. So it's like I think you can call wow wow experience, right? And uh, I mean, how how do you actually make it? So you just come on Monday and thinking how to create wow 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 impression, and then just then you you build maybe three three or four options, and you check what is more most wow yes. x, and <laughs> just or just like nice slide to have. So 
you see my question? You want to take that one? Uh, yeah, uh, no, it's a super fair question as well. Like, what defines a wow moment? Um, it's all pretty, like, arbitrary, I guess. But um, we actually, uh, one of our previous product designers actually did a talk on um, compression, on, on animations. I think the whole discussion was, do you, do you A, B, or user test animations? Um, the reality is that we, we only have probably about, like, eight product designers inside the company. So to have that sort of, like, ability or power to churn out a lot of different variations is also something that we don't have at this stage. Um, a lot of it is gut feeling and also a lot of it is like throwing these experiments out and seeing if they do work. I mean we obviously like within a small team we assess like is this wow or like <laughs> is this is this going to have impact or um, but I, I guess like when you start to get it like sort of like larger scale like Google, Facebook and all this sort of stuff you can have like insane optimization on these sort of things but at this moment I guess part of it's gut Part of it is just like peer assessment and part of it also just like A-B testing it and then going with the variant that, that's more successful. To the point though, like adding the, the, the user's name or the customer's name on the card, we don't, I don't guess we'll ever know the impact of that. Um, so maybe that's a wow moment, we never, maybe it's, maybe it's unwow, but um, it's something that we sort of thought that maybe we can fight for this and maybe make this personalization a bit more of a better experience for the user. And last question, uh, I'm from originally from Ukraine, I know just one month ago they started a totally similar bank, it's called Monobank, just um, I'm wondering if you heard of this. Heard I'll of watch it. it. I don't know, no, I actually haven't heard of it. Um, but what was it called, sorry? Uh, Monobank, Monobank, oh, no. so it's totally the same business model. It's okay. Yeah, thanks. Oh, interesting. No, cool. Thank you. Um, over there, you can pass it on to you. I'll, I'll pass it on in a second. Um, what, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, what what is the role in uh, competitors or um, or maybe partners uh, like old banks, big uh, banks in in your growth? So so, uh, so what's what's the question? Sorry. What <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. sorry. Uh, what what is what would be the role uh, for for you guys in the growth of N26 um, of of the competition or maybe partners? So mm -hmm. like Deutsche Bank or, or other yeah. banks. Uh, yeah. So I mean. Uh, we get this question asked a lot that what do you think about competition now we have similar challenger banks so called from the UK like Revolut and all these companies it's like if you see the banking industry even right now you have Deutsche Bank you have Sparkasa you have Comets Bank Post Bank all of these coexist in the same ecosystem at the same time and I'm sure a lot of you over here must be using different different banks so we are dealing in a space and an industry where the market is so huge that there is a lot of space for multiple banking services to exist at the same time. It's, it's never going to be an industry, just like the, 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 the car industry. There is never going to be one player takes it all. Multiple people can exist and can have good businesses depending on how they take their product strategy to the next level. So, for example, if N26 has a certain strategy of moving forward with the kind of products that we are thinking versus another challenger bank might have a different strategy of uh, on what kind of products do they want to build. But both can coexist. Like Time will tell which strategy works better than the other. Maybe they're both two in different ways. Uh, just like some rough statistics that I am aware of in the entire European Union, there are 600 million consumer bank accounts. And how many banks are we talking about in every different country, in every different EU country? Uh, so I think in terms of growth, it's more about right now about awareness that people need to understand that we are a legitimate bank and not just any kind of, you know, a finance app that does th this thing, like that does uh, these fancy uh, animations and graphics and whatnot, because that is what is missing. So as a growth team, this is one of our bigger challenges that how do we communicate the idea that we are a, a legit bank with a banking license and then get people to, uh, to our experiences, as we mentioned earlier, that how do we create more people from our existing customers? How do we get people through the entire funnel to start using N26 to understand what this is about? How long does it usually take for a user uh, from the first touch point he has with N26, whichever one that might be, to become a verified customer? And do you see along the way that people become hesitant, maybe uh, moving from their traditional banking to a bank that's completely on their, on their smartphone? So, I mean, numbers are a bit arbitrary at this moment because if you sit right right now here, start the sign-up process, you can finish it up in the next 10, 11 minutes. So it's 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 uh, it's possible in, in under 10 minutes. Uh, I think if I take an analogy with games, you see different games like software games that we have, uh, they, they start with the hype and then they sort of go down. 
our curve is completely different. People start slowly, so they might start putting in 200 euros and start using the MasterCard and starting getting the experience. Okay, this works really cool. I can use the MasterCard everywhere. I get real-time push notifications. And then they start increasing the activity with the account. So it's completely opposite. That people grow into our product and other product, uh, products which start with the hype, they grow out of that product. Like they start with the hype, everyone uses them, then it dies down. I don't know how many people are playing Pokemon Go right now. But uh, N26 activity increases. And it's just the nature of a banking product is such that the lifetime value is over like 10, 15 years. So when people, and th this is what we want, we want people to grow into the product and slowly explore after three months of usage, start exploring, okay, I would also like to have an overdraft and uh, make it into my salary account. So this, this happens uh, over a period of time. Um, I think it's also important to understand that like when you are signing up to a new financial service like a bank, um, it is understandably cautious, especially if there's no face to face. Like a lot of the, the younger generations we see coming through, it, it's it's not such a problem for them. I don't want to ever have to speak to a teller like at the, at the bank, so why should I why should I focus with, with a bank that's offline? Um, I think it's understandable though that, that people are a bit cautious and they want to get their toes wet first and use the service a little bit. They might top up their account. And I guess it's more about this, this sort of journey that when they start and say, hey, I want to join N26, what is the sort of uh, relationship we want to have with our user to slowly build them into a fully fledged, like, I mean, the, the thing is that um, we also don't want to capitalize on the user as soon as they join as well. So that's why we keep the, the account free. Um, it's more of the understanding of that <clears throat> if they use our service and they trust our service, if they need to take their next credit decision because they're comfortable with our ecosystem, that they might lean to us um, as opposed to any other service. So it's not about like yeah, capitalizing on them as soon as they join. I mean, there, there are sort of revenue streams we have like N26 Black and stuff, but um, yeah, it's more about the, the customer lifetime value of building this relationship and slowly watching it uh, yeah, grow. Cool. I'll ask a quick question. So, yeah, you mentioned that uh, in actually response to the last question that maybe it's 10, 11 minutes to go through the onboarding process to get set up. But there actually is that period where they have to wait for the card. Um, and at least in my experience joining maybe a year ago, I love the product, but it took quite a long time for me to actually get the physical card. And that's just, I guess it's growing quickly. You know, they have to produce a lot. It takes time in the mail. Maybe my address was screwed up. Who knows, right? But... Um, Actually, probably my address was screwed up once, but <laughs> um, but I guess what I'm trying to get at is, you know, as you think about growth and you think about the entire funnel, and you also think about looking at cohorts and you know different metrics, and those include things that are clearly completely outside of your control. You know, if some of these things you just have a production freeze or whatever, you know, whatever it might be, or a problem with the mail. Um, you know, how do you think about that, and how do you design around that? How do you look at your data and actually assess? Okay, you know this is due to something that's out of my hands or, you know. Yeah, no, it's a very fair point because it's like we control the entire experience from start registration all the way till your card's been sent and you're inside the N26 app. Um, and at this point, it's all about feedback loops and making sure they understand at what stage in the process they are. Um, we also didn't originally, so once you sort of signed the, you complete the verification, you put in your transaction code, you create one, you pair your phone, and then you're inside the, inside the app and it says your card's been sent, but there was no other feedback that was sitting there. Um, we saw lots of feedback coming in, like, I've lost my card, I can't find it, but we didn't set the right expectations to say, this might be within like one, like two to 14 days. So I think it, that was a very important thing that we learned, that expectation management is very crucial for this at this sort of stage. Because um, yeah, there's always going to be external factors, like we cannot control how fast DHL or Deutsche Post or UPS or whatever delivers their packages. Um, we also can't control um, yeah, whether, whether the address was correct or not, but we just sort of like, as long as we keep the user in the loop um, in terms of what is happening at each stage of the process, and also I guess like open communication. I think that one of our core values is transparency, um, like our cards, but that's sort of where that came from. But um, I think that's, that's crucial in all of that. So keeping the user updated, the, the emails that get sent out, they, send, they sort of expectation of it should arrive by this day, if not, reach out to us because we can sort of sort it out from there. So yeah. Thank you. And I think that's like just to add to that because we mentioned express delivery and uh, the address format. The actual process that happens is if a card gets returned to us, that means if the user did not get the card, we are not allowed to use the same card anywhere else because it has been opened by somebody else apart from the user. So what in that case, the protocol is that we have to trigger another card. That means the company who actually manufactures the MasterCard will start producing another card for that user. It will be shipped again, which also causes the delay. So for us, it's extremely important to reduce the return rate in the first place. That means whatever it takes to improve the sign-up form or the address form or the first shipping in the first place. Otherwise, when 
the user falls back into the loop of the cycle again, it will just be delayed by another two, three days, which is also not ideal. So to, to, like, to, to your question that like, this is important for us to analyze every step, that's why no detail is too small for us. So, like this address thing is very easy to miss, but we have to scrutinize it to the last minute uh, to make sure that this situation does not come up. Um, so I'm having a question to like the beginning when you started out. Um, I want to know like in an industry used on security and face-to-face -face consultation, how did you get the first people to trust you in the first place? Yeah, but, uh, yeah I mean, so as far as, uh, so I mean, I've been in the company since uh, March of this year. So as much I have learned about uh, talking to people who've been since the early days, including the founders and some other employees who we have since the longest time. Uh, one thing is that, at least in the tech industry, you know, the products like these, there are always early adopters. You can find your friends, your family, like the first 50, 100 customers will always be your friends and family and people who you know, you know people who might know people who are willing to try it out. So that is also sort of the approach of any, like startup founder or anyone, I'm assuming, who uh, tries to get the first 100 people, uh, make them love the product, like understand how they're using it, get feedback from them, and then sort of do any kind of a growth strategy. I don't think a growth team should exist in a company which doesn't even have like a couple of thousand users, uh, and they've actually understood a product market fit. Uh, then only any of these hacks would, or any things that we talked about would make sense till the time you understand people need this, and they would be willing to sign up. Um, yeah, actually, it's, it's a fair point as well because I think that um, the first 50 customers actually verified in person with Valentin and Maximilian. So I guess that was a bit of a, <laughs> a little bit different. Um, then we started to scale a little bit more, obviously, and we obviously couldn't get everyone coming through. We wouldn't be able to do half a million <laughs> face to face. Um, that was cool. Um, the, the next thing was also when we sort of launched in Germany, um, we had the option to do the verification call via video chat, but we also had the option to, to verify in person at, at a at a post office, um, where you would actually say, send me, a, send me a coupon, it would get sent to your email. So people that weren't, I mean, either camera shy or they just sort of didn't trust this process of, am I actually getting a legit bank from doing this over the video call? They could actually print out the document, um, yeah, go to the post office, they get a stamp and it takes two days and then they're verified. Um, so there was also that, but obviously as we started to scale, we launched in France, and it's also a question of do we want to start having these manual processes in place? We found that it wasn't so necessary, and people were sort of very, very up for getting on the phone and doing a video chat, because it's much simpler, the, simpler, the, the experience is much better, um, and, and we guess that people love this a, a lot more, as we can see that with the numbers as well. Um, I, I guess also to that as well is when you are a fresh product, it's also about being personal as well. So uh, like at least relatable. So that's why we try and focus on these like delightful experiences and, and things that at least sort of takes the edge off um, sort of treading in the unknown territory. So yeah, that's how we sort of try and build that relationship. <laughs>